Okay. All right. Good morning, everybody, or afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Um, this is field day number 27 of the USDA NIFA Agriculture Genome to Phenome Initiative. My name is Jack Deckers. I'm a professor in uh, animal science, animal breeding and genetics at Iowa State University and one of the co-PIs of, uh, <clears throat> of this uh, initiative. And um, yeah, so field day number 27, and uh, we're going to talk today about uh, data sharing and data confidentiality, how to deal with data confidentiality. Um, I'll be one of, the, uh, one of the presenters. I'll give an introduction, and then uh, we'll be followed by uh, Hao Cheng and then by uh, Juan Steibel. Um, so Hao is an assistant professor at the uh, uh, University of California, Davis. And Rowan is a professor, the last chair at Iowa State University. Um, and we, um, okay, <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> as we go through this, please uh, put your uh, questions in the chat uh, and we'll follow those and we will answer those if needed at, at the time. Otherwise, we'll, uh, we'll uh, address those questions after the presentations. Um, and we don't have a big group. We can also, during the question session, just uh, have people speak up. Okay, so we are going to talk about, uh, well, the impetus for this is uh, uh, is a seed grant that How received along with uh, Richard Mott from um, um, University College of Lo London, uh, myself and Chris Tuggle from Iowa State, and also a coconut grant that uh, Juan Steibel and others received. Um, different ways of dealing with uh, data sharing or collaboration when uh, there are issues with uh, uh, confidentiality of the data. So that's where we're going. That's the impetus. Um, of course, we all know that uh, you know there's lots of benefits to data sharing. <coughs> excuse me, and to collab collaborating. Um, now it's important to share the data such that others can validate the results. Also, such that others can reuse the data for joint analyses or other analyses with those data, uh, and um, also collaborative analyses, meta analyses, um, and yeah, and collaboration, as is put put there. And we're all familiar with the FAIR data standard, so that uh, uh, the idea that uh, data should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, and um, in human genetics, that's been very effective. You now, there's a requirement that a lot of the data be shared and that studies uh, provide metadata that can be incorporated in meta analyses. And this is a graph from a recent uh, publication um, talking about 15 years of GWAS discovery in human, human genetics. And it shows for uh, human GWAS studies. Uh, the number of publications over uh, over over the years, so per year, so it has been a steady, fairly significant increase. I'm not sure why it went went down in 2022. Um, the average size of GWAS studies, so that could be you know a meta analysis combining multiple studies, but uh, it started fairly uh, very limited, uh, you know less than. A thousand or around a thousand, and we're now on average, and this is across uh, all these studies, on average, uh, one hundred and forty thousand uh, records are included in a GWAS analysis or a, a, a meta analysis. So they've really capitalized on uh, large data sets, and as a result, if you look at the green line, the the number of genome-wide significant uh, hits. Has, has increased. And so this really demonstrates the, the power of uh, uh, building large data sets and uh, uh, generating um, uh, statistics and, and GWAS uh, analyses using these large data sets. Uh, a study that uh, I've been involved in, and, and one reason I mentioned this study is because it's also being used in uh, some of the research we'll talk about is a natural disease challenge model uh, to evaluate, evaluate the genetics of disease resilience in pigs. And this is a, a project where seven breeding companies have come together. They're part of the Pig Gen Research Consortium. So seven breeding companies have come, to, come together and said, well, we can't 
address the genetics of disease resilience in pigs on our own. So we have to uh, uh, combine our efforts. And they did that by you know, submitting proposals. And I was involved in that, Graham Plesto and others who were involved in that, Chris Stuggle also, uh, funded by Genome Canada, Genome Alberta and Genome Prairie, and also uh, funding from, from USDA. And um, but lot substantial in kind and financial support also from the breeding companies. And the idea is to send batches of pigs from um, from the breeding companies through a natural disease challenge and then collect extensive data during the challenge as well as prior to the challenge. Um, each batch comes from a different breeding company. Um, the aim here is not to compare breeding companies, but really to do uh, GWAS, to do genomic prediction, and to identify potential genetic indicators that can be collected on young healthy pigs before they go into the disease challenge in order to select for, uh, allow breeding companies to implement genetic selection for disease resilience. Um, so yeah, those are projects that uh, um, need lots, are very expensive, and so only by combining resources uh, um, is, this, is this possible, unless you're a very big company. Um, in terms of, uh, this shows the, uh, the, uh, the benefit of uh, sharing data for genomic prediction. So this shows a growth rate in, under the challenge. The blue line, so each uh, letter is a company. Um, the blue line is the, uh, the accuracy of genomic prediction in terms of a correlation with uh, the validation phenotype. When we only use data from that company, and so there's 3,200 animals that uh, we have records on in total. So on average, it's about 450 animals per company. Uh, and then the orange lines is when we, uh, um, looking at the accuracy of genomic predictions for that company when we add also the data from the other companies. And for most of them, you see a, a sizable increase in the genomic prediction area uh, accuracy. So not only uh, with uh, um, combining data were we able to get better uh, GWAS results and, and, and estimates of genetic parameters, but also from a company perspective, there was benefit in uh, um, utilizing the data from another company. And the sa a similar thing we see for mortality, there's, there's a lot of variability and it doesn't, you know, it's small data sets. It doesn't always uh, um, turn out as you expect, but on average, there is a benefit of, uh, uh, of increasing, uh, of using data from other companies. Of course, there's issues here because these seven companies are uh, uh, stiff competitors. And uh, and they um, they don't want to share their data or aspects of the data they don't want to make available to other companies. Um, for us as researchers, the data is uh, um, anonymized, so we know that which data comes from um, from a company, but we don't know which company it is. Um, so these letters are we don't know who is A, who is B, etc. And then also each company, the data goes into a centralized database at the University of Alberta, but each company only has access to their own data, to the data from on their own animals. Um, I think, let's see. Yeah, so before I go here, let's do a couple of polls. I'm gonna launch a poll and the first one is um, just to give get a little bit better idea of uh, um, where each of you are from or, or the demographics. So um, what, what best describes your affiliation, academia or public research or industry or, or other. So I'll wait a, a few minutes or a few seconds. Okay, so um, looks like I share the results. Um, so most of pe people on online here are uh, from academia or from a re public research institute, but we, fortunately we also have a few people from industry. So um, that's good to know. Um, let's see. Okay, the second poll. Let's see. Okay. So the second poll, uh, what best describes your role in relation to agriculture genome to phenome re research? Are you a data creator or a data provider? 
or are you uh, a data user? So you're getting data from others or, or both? Okay, so uh, why the num, let's see. Okay, so quite a number of you are uh, do both. You create data and you use data from others. Um, there are, there's one one person online who uh, considers him or herself a data creator, data provider, uh, and some quite a number of you um, both create data and use data from others. So. Um, Okay, uh, the next poll, um, as a data user, so or you, in your role as a data user, do you use data for AG2P research that was generated mostly in industry? So now we're looking at the data you get from others or mostly in uh, academia uh, or, or both. You get some data from industry and you get some data from academia. Okay, so I'll share these results. So there are several who, um, most of the data comes from industry. Um, quite a number that uh, the data mostly comes from a research institute, institute or academia and uh, several that uh, get data from both, both sources. Okay, let me, actually I did share. Okay, so um, quite varied in terms of responses, but you know, clearly quite a number who are getting data from, from industry. All right, so, um, so in particular with the data to, from industry there, there can be issues, but also, you know, same for data from uh, um, uh, uh, academic uh, sources. So yeah, there are often restrictions on data sharing. There could be uh, confidential content, uh, that uh, privacy uh, um, data. And of course, human genetics, they deal with a lot with that in terms of uh, 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 yeah, pri pri privacy of the, the patient information, uh, but it could also have proprietary content or commercially sensitive content. And I would consider you know, the example that I gave of uh, um, for pigs and disease resilience, that would mostly would be commercially sensitive content that uh, the companies don't want to share. So let's look at that a little bit more as far as um, getting some insight into our audience. So uh, when it comes to confidential data, does the data that you generate or use for AG2P research contain confidential information that cannot be shared or made, made public? Um, so Yes, almost always, or sometimes, or never, or it doesn't apply to my situation. Okay, so um, yeah, so everybody who I guess who's using data at least sometimes encounters that uh, that issue where not all the data can be shared. So, um, so it is certainly among the among the group online. It, it it is a it is an issue. So let's look a little bit more. Um, so next poll question: When you're a creator of data that are relevant to AG2P research, how do you keep, make this typically available to collaborators or others without any restrictions? Uh, so open access, so no limitations, um, with restrictions on further sharing or it doesn't apply to your situation. Okay, so um, in cases where it applied, almost always is there is a, there is almost always a restriction um, for, for, many, for many of you. So again, pointing out that uh, the ability or the, the, the need to share data uh, without restrictions is, uh, is, is an issue, would, will be an issue for most of us. Okay, and the last one here, let's see. 
Okay, does data confidentiality limit your ability to conduct a, a to B, a, AG2P research with others? Okay, let me launch. Sorry. Okay, here it is. Does data confidentiality limit your ability to conduct AG, AG2P research with others? So confidentiality or proprietary content or commercial restrictions on data sharing. Does it limit that uh, ability to do research often, sometimes, or never? Okay, so uh, one of you said it never um, limits the research I do, but uh, for the rest, um, yeah, sometimes or often. So here we go. Okay, so one said never. 12 out of 20 said so sometimes, and three out of 20 said often limits what I do with, uh, with what, what I can do in terms of AG2P research. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about this. So um, yeah, in terms of data sharing, um, many journals, as we all know, now put, requirements on data sharing. And this is from genetics. Uh, in their data policy, policy it says that, says that all data that are necessary for confirming the conclusions that are presented in the manuscript must be made publicly available. The journal policy does not allow for data to be available upon request. And, and that's a solution that we've heard, for, uh, we've used, for example, with the disease res resilience research, where we say that we can give access to the data um, upon request, up, upon reasonable request, and that would have to have to be approved by the by the data generators or by the breeding companies. Uh, but then the genetics policy says for studies that include genotype and DNA sequences, the genotypes or sequences for all individuals should be provided, uh, and and in a in a in a useful for, format that can be uh, that is usable. Okay, so clear statement that uh, all the data needs to be available. Also, uh, last year, the Office of Science and Technology Policy of um, the Office of the President of the US came out with a memorandum <clears throat> to uh, funding agencies for federal funding agencies that stated that, um, um, that these agencies have to develop public access policies by the end of uh, 2025, that um, allow or that in, that um, um, state that, that, that making publications and the supporting data resulting from federally funded research publicly accessible, without any embargo on their free and public release. So any any research that is funded by um, the federal government. The data that is generated uh, and the publications generated, they have to be freely accessible. So let's, so, so you no, know, this is already true now. This is in the future we'll, where there's increasing demands on making data publicly available. So let's look at uh, the impact that this may have. So the next poll, uh, have, you, have you ever encountered cases as an author or co-author where the choice of the journal you published your results in, your work in, was driven by the journal's data sharing policy? Okay, so... Uh, about well, a third of you said yes, often. Third of you says sometimes. Third of you said um, said never. So um, so yeah. So it is it, it, again. Point. So there there is an issue that uh, um, you know we are to some degree driven by publishing in journals that um, don't require uh, free access to uh, to the data because of likely because of the restrictions that the data providers uh, put on us. Okay, so uh, next poll. Okay. 
Okay, so uh, with federal requirements to make all data public, as we see is going to be required, will it limit the funding sources that you will be able to apply, uh, apply to for AG2P research? Okay, so um, almost all of you uh, indicated, or, or who it applies, indicated that it would be an issue at least sometimes. Okay, um, so yeah, so I think clearly data sharing or data sharing requirements are going to, uh, uh, are, are important and to some degree will limit where we publish our results and what we can do and if uh, the directive by the White House uh, is, uh, proceeds, will limit the, the type of research that we can apply to. So what can we do about it as a research community? We could, uh, um, so are there ways that we can share data and collaborate without revealing confidential information, without you know, explicitly having to share the data? Um, and also, you know, are there ways we can share data uh, without revealing confidential information? And of course, you know, to some degree in human genetics, they, they do that. Uh, one is to do meta-analysis. They only provide metadata from a study that, that allows us to proceed in combining, uh, combining studies, but it doesn't meet uh, the needs of uh, the requirements of journals, of some journals, and also not, it wouldn't meet the requirement of uh, uh, the federal government go, going forward. Another one is data encryption. So to encrypt the data in a way, and we'll talk about how we'll talk about that, to encrypt the data in a way that uh, still um, allows the data be, to be used for, um, for validation, for additional research, but uh, the confidential information is, um, is, is hidden from whoever is has access to the data. And of course, the question there is, well, is this encryption? Does that uh, address the, uh, the concerns that data providers have? And does it uh, address the requirements that journals and the federal government are imposing on data sharing? So is this sufficient to, uh, to uh, uh, meet uh, the needs of um, or the, the, the goals of both journals and the federal government. So that's one thing that we have to keep in mind and we should, we should look at. Um, and then there's federated learning or transfer learning, and Juan will talk, talk about that, where the data stays with the, uh, the, the original organization that created the data, that owns the data, uh, and some of the analyses are done at the local level, but then uh, they are combined uh, uh, outside with, 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 uh, uh, you know, through the computational methodology and the statistical methodology. Uh, it essentially does uh, end up being a joint analysis without having to share the data. And, and Juan will talk more about much more about that. Of course, that that would um, could address the confidentiality issue that. Uh, um, you know, the inability of companies to share their data with other companies, uh, but it may not address the uh, requirements of journals or of the federal government. So that's something we, we should also start thinking about. So um, actually, let me, I think there's two polls, two final polls that I'll uh, ask you to fill out. Um, the first one is, um, if you have concerns about data sharing or the people or organizations that provide you the data have concerns, uh, you know, based on your understanding of encryption, would sharing encrypted data resolve these concerns? And I realize that not all of you may fully know what's behind the encryption, um, but want to get a heads up view of um, what people think. So uh, some of you say yes, some of you say yes sometimes. Um, 
quite a number of you say uh, maybe or I don't know, and several of you say no, it wouldn't. And it would be good to go come back to a discussion later on and, and uh, find out well why why would it not address uh, why would data encryption not address those issues? But we'll come back to that after uh, how is explained what we mean by data encryption and what it, what it can do and what it cannot do. And then finally, final uh, poll. Um, if you want to collaborate with others or on joint analyses using data that cannot be shared or not everything can be shared, in your understanding of federated analysis, would that be an option? Okay, and so some of you say, yes, that would be an option. Uh, some of you, yes, that might sometimes be an option. Uh, but half of you say um, not sure, and um, one of you says uh, no. That would not be an uh, would not be an option. Sorry, I didn't. I forgot to share. Okay, so sounds like an option, but uh, may not work in all all cases. But let's uh, uh, let's hear from um, Juan and from how and hear more about uh, what data encryption is, what it can do, how it works, and then. One will talk about uh, the uh, homomorphic, um, sorry, about the federated and transfer uh, uh, data analyses. So I'll pause here to uh, see if there's any questions that anybody has at this point. Otherwise, uh, we will um, proceed with how how's presentation. Any questions? I don't think I see any. Anybody have a question? Just speak up if you have a question. Okay, if not, uh, how the floor is yours. Okay, great. Uh, Jack, thank you for the nice introduction. So I saw that it's like in poll nine about data encryption, most of you vote as say, I don't know, and maybe hopefully the next 30 minutes, I can spend the next 30 minutes to persuade you that, I mean, data encryption is really a solution. Um, to enable as a sharing of confidential data. So the next 30 minutes, I will, oh, I'm Hao Chun from UC Davis. This, the, 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 the one I'm going to talk about is based on a seed grant we received from AG2PI. So I'm going to talk about this one. Uh, for the next 30 to 40 minutes, I'm going to talk about basic ideas of let's like, say homomorphic encryption for data sharing. And then we are going to jump to one example. So. Let me send this. I have sent you a Jupyter notebook link to, to Zoom chat. So I'm going to walk you through this kind of, I mean, a small example to show you more details of uh, the encryption method. Hopefully after this one, you will see actually this method is a, it's a, it's a quite simple method, but it's very powerful. So that's the reason why I see it has lots of potential to be used for, for, for data sharing. It's simple, but it's useful. Okay, so. Yeah, Jack mentioned this one. So we have the fair principle for the data sharing. And, but we also have lots of concerns, let's say privacy concerns, IP concerns, and trade secret concerns, and all these concerns. What might be a potential solution is something I call it, I call it safe data. So basically secure encryption of the data. What does that mean? That means uh, we are going to protect the confidential information in your data set, okay? For that one, we still allow further validation and research using the encrypted data only. So not, we, we're not going to touch the raw data, just the encrypted data for further validation and research. And in some sense, by using the encrypted data and sometimes the key, basically the, the key you use to encrypt data, will be able to obtain the same outcomes and results. I will give you more details. Okay, for this project, really, uh, uh, we, we, uh, we work with Richard Moore from, I mean, University College London from the UK, Jack also mentioned at Jack, and uh, two of my students, TNG and Dona, they contribute a lot to, 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 to the slides and the result I'm going to present today. Of course, at the beginning, I guess I should, I mean, briefly explain what homomorphic encryption is. Um, I've, after explaining this concept to, 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 
to multiple I mean, uh, scientists and students, I feel like the easiest way for me to do it will be, I mean, draw a graph and explain it as step by step. So let's, let's not, now let's imagine a situation. We, we are the data owner. Can you see my cursor? So we are the data owner, okay? We, we want to send the data for somebody to, to analyze the data, send, some, send the data to some data analyst. So the idea will be, we do not want to share the raw data, which is something I, I mean, uh, draw here. So it's a blue box. Let's say these are, these are original data. But what we can do is like, we can use our homomorphic encryption, or let's say one type of data encryption method to encrypt the data first. So we'll get the uh, orange box. So which this is the encrypted data, okay? And then we are going to transfer the encrypt data to the data analyst who will be able to help us to analyze our data. Okay, or let's say someone we are willing to share our data with. It's like for, for Jack's example, I'm willing to share the data with Jack, so, 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 so he will be able to help me to analyze the data for genome prediction and GWAS. But then the data analyst, or like the data scientist, they are going to use the encrypt data to do their data analysis and get the encrypted output. Okay, this can be like say uh, market effects and this can be some GWAS results and this can be some genetic, uh, encrypted genetic values. And then we are going to return the encrypted output back to us, to the data owner. And then we'll be able to use the same key to decrypt the encrypted output and to get the decrypted output. If you have a look at the figure here, um, the blue boxes represent, I mean, raw data and uh, the output we want. And for, but the, the orange boxes represent the, the, the encrypted, I mean, data and the encrypted output. One example for uh, genome to phenome analysis will be, let's say the data, uh, let's say genotypes and phenotypes and the output uh, is the estimated genetic values. If you think about this one will be, we have our raw genotype and phenotype, we increase them at first, and then we transfer them to somebody who will do the data analysis. And then they are going to get the encrypted EBV, or estimate genetic value. Then they return the encrypted estimate genetic value back to us, and they will use the key to decrypt it. They will, then we'll get the estimate genetic value we want. So this is kind of like a big picture for homomorphic encryption. So uh, in terms of the specific homomorphic equation method we are working on for genotypes and phenotypes is actually proposed by our collaborator, Dr. Richard Moore, uh, uh, two years ago. So here I will briefly explain the concept behind this uh, method. It's, a, it's actually it's a quite simple method, but it's very useful, like a measure very powerful. Let's say we started with this kind of, I mean, small example. Uh, we have three individuals, A, B, C, D, and we collect their phenotype represented by this kind of vector of four elements and four numbers. And we also collect the genotype of these four individuals. So for here, each row represents one individual. And for each individual, we have, we have I mean, six markers, okay, six, six SNPs. So this is kind of like a typical data set. If you have been working with, I mean, genome prediction, GWAP, you, know, you should be very familiar with the, the structure of this kind of data set. In terms of the encryption method, what we can do is we can work on a linear transformation of the raw phenotype and genotype, okay, by multiplying a randomly generated orthogonal matrix and P to this kind of, I mean, genotype phenotype. It's something like this. Let's say the genotype is X and the phenotype is Y. What we are going to do is really we just pre-multiply the X and the Y by a uh, our so randomly generated our so matrix, let's say it's P. After we do, let's say this is an example for P, uh, this is a tiny example. This is a piece for this example, it's a four by four matrix, but it is our so matrix. And then what we're going to get, we are going to get encrypted genotypes and encrypted phenotypes. So it, the genotypes and phenotypes will look like this one, at least from this kind of small, examples 
we, we won't be able to tell, I mean, and the relationship between the original genotype and the increased genotype. That's the original phenotype and the, uh, the increased phenotype. So what, oh, one thing I mentioned is like, what, uh, this kind of, we are generating, the P is our orthogonal matrix. That means P transpose P is equal to an identity matrix. So that's kind of the definition for uh, our orthogonal matrix. What we are going to do is, in terms of homomorphic encryption, we are going to share the encrypt data only. So basically Px and Py, basically this matrix, encrypt genotypes and this vector and encrypt phenotypes, but we are not going to share the key. So basically as a data owner, we are going to keep the uh, P matrix, basically the orthogonal matrix by ourselves. We are not going to share that one. So that's kind of the idea behind it. This is the realization. I always like this kind of realization to, to, to show more information in terms of the, uh, the encrypted data. So how, how do encrypt genotype look like after we encrypt the genotype by pre-multiply it with a, a, a randomly generated orthogonal matrix? Uh, in this figure for, 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 plot, for figure A, this is kind of like the represent the uh, raw data. We are using uh, zero, one, two is kind of like the, the count of the reference value. Okay, so we have the kind of zero, one, two stuff. So we are using yellow to represent zero, gray to represent one, and uh, black to represent two. So the original data is really a matrix of zero, one, two, composed of only white, gray, and black. Okay, these kind of different three colors. But if you have, and if you look at, if you have a look at the distribution, we have really these kind of three numbers, zero, one, and two. So following this kind of distribution based on the, this record also re reflects the allele frequency for that uh, SNP. If you have a look at figure B, this is the encrypted genotype. The encrypt genotype, if you have a look at the distribution of this kind of encrypt genotype, it really follows a normal distribution here. So it's no longer zero, one, two, this kind of three categories. It follows a kind of like a continuous distribution for which is a normal distribution. So this is a, a realization for the uh, encrypted genotype. Uh, some features in terms of HEGP, homomorphic encryption of genotype phenotypes, is that the HEGP will keep or will preserve the relationships between, I mean, SNPs. So basically it's kind of the LD uh, uh, feature, or LD between SNP, it will still be busy. So in figure A here we have, it's like for this plot, we made the LD matrix, basically relationships between SNPs using the raw data, the raw uh, genotype. And then for, for this figure, we use the encrypt genotype to make the LD matrix. And uh, by looking at the figure there, same, I, of course, we also calculate the correlation, element-wise correlation, and the correlation is also equal to one, indicate they are, they are same. An, a, 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 another feature in terms of HEGP is like, where HEGP really destroy or scramble the relationships between individuals. So we have this kind of, we make the genomic relation matrix using the raw data, and we also make the genomic relation matrix using the encrypt data. Um, if we zoom in a little bit, you can see they are quite different. And if we calculate the element-wise, I mean, uh, correlation between these two matrix, the correlation is almost equal to zero. So this is uh, some uh, features in terms of HEGP. So basically the, the LD pattern, we still have it, we still keep it. That's the reason why it, it works. I will explain more later, but it scrambles, uh, I mean, the relationships among these individuals. So which is nice. So that means it's very hard for us to leak um, and, and, and to share any of this kind of individual level, I mean, raw, raw data, individual level information. Okay, so just a little bit technical detail for this one, on this one slide, we are uh, talking about why this kind of encryption method does not affect the estimated marker effect. So um, just, just start with the 
most basic, I mean, models for, for let's say, for genome prediction. Let's say now we can use, I mean, least square. Let's say we can use normal equation to, to solve the, the, uh, the, the mark effect, Y is the phenotype, X is the genotype, alpha is the uh, mark effect, and E is the residual. As many of us know, like the, in terms of, I mean, uh, it's a, a normal equation to solve a least, least square question, it's like this, uh, this is a normal equation. What we are going to do is like, we are going to do X transpose X alpha hat, and is equal to X transpose Y. Then we are going to solve this, I mean, normal equation to obtain uh, alpha hat, which is the estimated marker effect. Okay, this, uh, the, this is the simplest way in terms of doing genome, uh, let's say GWAS or genome prediction to get, I mean, estimated marker effect. This is using the raw data. Now let's think about, we are using the encrypt data. In terms of encrypt data, the only difference is now we are not using X and Y as a genotype phenotype. We are using PX and PY, which is the which are the encrypted genotypes and encrypted I mean phenotypes. So then, what happened in our what will happen in our normal equations? We really just replace X with PX and Y with PY. Okay, this will be the new I mean normal equation. What what we can see now is if you think about this one, so PX transpose PX is, is equal to X transpose P transpose PX. And as we know, uh, P is an orthogonal matrix. The definition for orthogonal matrix is really kind of like, as a property for uh, orthogonal matrix is really like P transpose P is, is an identity matrix. That means this one is really uh, equals X transpose X. Same thing for the right hand side. Let's say X transpose Y. When we do uh, PX transpose and PY, and we are going to get um, P trans X transpose, P transpose PY, and this one is equal to X transpose uh, Y. So what we can see is like, uh, actually this one just becomes, okay, this part just becomes X transpose X. This part just becomes X transpose Y. So in this kind of very simple way, we are really getting, I mean, basically we are solving same normal equation. Of course, we are going to get same solution for, for alpha hat. So we are, that means we are going to get same estimate market effect. But, but the nice thing will be, we are not using the raw X and raw Y, we are using the encrypted genotype of X and we're using the encrypted gen uh, phenotype Y. Um, this can be more complicated uh, um, the one I showed you is the normal equation, by, which is typically not used for genomic prediction on GWAS. So, but let's think about a, a more popular method in terms of, I mean, uh, GWAS and genome prediction, the Bayesian variable selection method, which allows, I mean, mixture price for, for mark effect, which, which allows us to incorporate additional information into, the, into, uh, into your analysis. So actually we have demonstrated this one um, because of the, from the support of the AG2P grant. So this one really helped us to dive into this method and, and really focus on see from a theory way, whether it works or from a application we're using real data, whether it works or not. And uh, yes, it works. So uh, a, a brief explanation here will be uh, in terms of Bayesian analysis, we are using the MCMC technique. So we are, we are, we are, we are, we are deriving this kind of four conditional posterior distribution uh, for mark effect and for all unknown parameters. And turns out, if you have a look at it, when we have, let's say, the genotype, and when we have the uh, phenotype in this kind of posterior, uh, conditional posterior distribution, they never appear independently. They appear together, let's say uh, X always appear to together with another X. So we basically we see them as X transpose X or X transpose Y. You see X transpose X and X transpose Y. In that case, the same, even though the normal equation one is a simple idea, but the simple idea, it can be generalized for, I mean, Bayesian variable selection method. So the idea will be, we're, we're going to replace in terms of the encrypt data analysis, 
we are going to replace x transpose x with px transpose px, the same thing. It becomes, I mean, x transpose x. Okay, the x transpose y, same thing. px transpose um, py, it also becomes x transpose y. So the, the idea is simple, but, but it works for more complicated method. Of course, our effort is it, 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 still ongoing, so we need to validate more method and, and uh, to see how it works for all um, most of this method which is non-prediction g -walk. But I would like to say, Bayesian verb selection methods are is already a relatively, I mean, I mean, complicated method for for genomic prediction G was, and we have demonstrated that for single trait analysis, it works very well, uh, which is the, the answer. So I saw one question uh, on chat, but I will I will answer that question later. And um, I will continue. So uh, that is kind of the theory part. Uh, in terms of the data analysis, what we did is like we did a simulation analysis. We we have already also have done the same thing for for the data Jack shared the real data Jack shared as in, 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 in his talk, and basically the conclusion uh, is is same. But uh, I'm for here I just present the the simulated data because for this one I will be able to demonstrate you with different I mean genetic architecture. Okay, so for here we are using a peak genotype data with about uh, 3,000 individuals and 50K marker. Um, we do some quality control for these markers and then we simulate different, I mean, genetic architecture to make sure, let's say, this, this encryption method will work for different scenarios. So we have, we simulate different heritability from quite relative low heritability 0.1 to relative high heritability 2.7. And we simulate, I mean, different number of, I mean, uh, causal variant. So from one person to one hundred percent, some of them are not very realistic. But we are just trying to, I mean, cover all different situations. And we simulate, I mean, different group effects. And we 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 repeat it many times and ten ten replicates. And we then we we do the encryption and we run, uh, a the, the Bayesian variables, one Bayesian variable selection method, which is basically pi. Uh, basically, the result I can tell you now is really that we, we are getting, I mean, almost identical result. So, so, so for that, for, for this slide, we are talking about we are getting, I mean, we got I mean, identical estimated breeding values. If you have a look at uh, uh, this one, we have for this table is cross different, I mean, heritability and different, I mean, percentage of uh, causal variant. So the correlation between the estimated breeding value using the raw data, and let's say the estimated breeding value using the encrypt data is, is almost one. And this is a figure to show that. So, 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 so if the dots are falling on this line, that means they are, they are identical. So the correlation is almost equal to one. Is 0.991. <clears throat> um, we are also get the identical estimated marker effect, same idea. So using the raw data or as the, using the encrypted data, the correlation is is again very close to uh, uh, one. This is a table showing uh, the result. I mean across different uh, uh, scenarios and different. I mean I mean genetic architectures. And uh, this one shows a plot, I mean, in terms of for, 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 for each mark, what the value is. And uh, sometimes we are, we are interested in not just a single SNP, but we're interested in a, I mean, a small genomic window, unless that can be a, a one megabyte window. So what will that happen? It is very for, 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 for GWAS. So for this one, again, we are, we are seeing, let's say, uh, genetic correlation, I mean, close to a one. So basically this kind of the result using this kind of, I mean, uh, a real genotype data, but simulated, I mean, uh, phenotype data. But like I mentioned, uh, uh, when we use, I mean, the, the data Jack just showed the real genotype, real phenotype, basically it's the, the same thing. We observe the same, the same conclusion. Another nice thing in terms of the, our data encryption method is uh, kind of like what Jack mentioned. 
sometimes, let's say for, for, for each company, or let's say for each uh, contributor, they have a, a small data set. Ideally, we want to combine multiple data sets together, okay, and, and to do a data analysis. Um, but but um, when we do meta analysis, what we want to share, or let's say if we want to share the data, so to which level I should share the data, I know, we, we all know by combining this data together, it, it's more powerful. We will get more accurate genomic prediction and all this stuff. In terms of benefit, I do think our data encryption method um, provide one solution. This is an example, really. So let's say we have uh, two companies, or let's say two contributors. This is one, this is another one, it's a tiny example. And then what we can do is that we'll be able to encrypt, I mean, the genotype and phenotype data from company one, or let's contribute to one, and we'll be able to encrypt the genotype uh, uh, from company two and phenotype from company two. One thing you can see how I'm having P1 for company one and P2 for company two, that is telling you that we, are, you, you can, we can use different key, okay? Basically, each company can use its own key to encrypt the genotype, their own genotype phenotype. Okay, what they are going to do is that they are going to share this data set, maybe with a, with a third party who will be able to do the data analysis, or they, they, or, or they can share the data with each other. Okay, they just share the raw data. And then they'll be able to do a joint analysis. So basically allow each contributor to the joint data to use its own private um, key prior to sharing the data. Uh, I saw multiple, uh, um, I have one more slide, let me finish it, then I can come, come back to the question. And then we can have a look at the notebook uh, quickly. Oh, so like I mentioned, be, of course, because of the support of seed grounds, it's, it's great. We will be able to demonstrate the patient variable selection method, single trait base C, it works for, for this kind of homomorphic encryption uh, and, uh, and using encrypted data, but there are still some additional work we need to work on. Uh, for example, we have demonstrated work for GBLOB, ABLOB, Bish Alphabet, but there's still something we need to work more. Let's say we need to study whether to work for categorical trait by using threshold model, or uh, let's say whether, whether multiple trait work. We have got some preliminary analysis in turn in theory, okay, it looks like multiple traits will work and let's say a uh, single step method, which is very popular in, 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 in animal breeding, which is more complicated. And how about, let's say, I saw that, how about AI? How about neural networks? That's, um, that's something we should um, study. Okay, so for these slides, I'm, I'm, I will jump to the um, Jupyter notebook, but before that, um, I will have a look at the questions. Uh, uh, if, if, if you want, you can already click the link. I'll send you the link uh, over chat. You can click the link, have a look at the notebook. It's that notebook is quite self-explained. It's like really just basically, it's, it's just for everything I showed you here. I just show you the example. You will be able to see the numbers and feel more comfortable to see uh, this is a simple, but powerful message. So, so how we have about five minutes. So um, you want to go to the chat questions? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Let me... so yeah, so one uh, one question is, uh, are you able to annotate encrypted SNPs to find out which gene is associated with the trait? Uh, yes. So it's a, it's a... Yeah, Anya, that's a that's a good question. So the, the idea is like this. So um, by using this kind of encrypted method, we'll still be able to get the estimated market fat. We will still be able to get the same p value for that. I mean, uh, for that market, as long as you you know the original map file, basically you still know. I mean, the for SNP one, where's the location, where's the position, which chromosome is on. They'll still be able to annotate the encrypted SNP. That will be no problem for this one. Yeah. And then her second question is: How do you how do you assure that the SNP coded zero for one company is not coded as two for the other? 
uh, yeah, that is a really uh, good question. Yeah, we, we, so so that's the reason why I'm saying this match is simple, but we need to establish some uh, standard. So before sharing the data, we should have some standard. For example, we say, okay, based on, we, we, based on, we are, based on zero, one, two, we are counting the reference value. So which one we should use as a reference value. But, but that one, of course, as long as we have a standard, it's very, it's very straightforward. As long as everyone is following the standard, which is, which is, which won't cause a problem. Uh, but yes, Anya, this is a really good question. So that means make really establish a nice workflow and nice protocol because you, 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 you may kind of, you're seeing this one, it's very, very important. It's simple, but we need to make it very clear to make sure when we are sharing the input data, we have everyone's following the standard. If we mess up this one, yeah, no, it, it won't work. Yeah, but I, I, I guess this is even not something about encrypt data. If, if this is a question about, let's say, just sharing raw data with each other, if you code it in a wrong way, it may cause a problem. Yeah, but at least then you can check, right? I mean, if you get data from both sides, you can you can yeah. build in some check checks as a data analyzer, which you wouldn't be able to do with the encrypted yeah. data. Right? Yeah. Um, and then the last question that uh, is in the chat, um, in the era of AI, is encrypted data safe? Uh, so could somebody yeah, encrypt the data using AI? I was wondering whether that's a question. Or this is kind of some question related to what I just mentioned. It's like we, we, we want to know whether uh, our method of work with, I mean, neural network and all this matter, this is really some ongoing, I mean, uh, research. In terms of the, let me share my screen. But it's, but it's, this is more about uh, the security. So could somebody uh, find the key, solve the key? using ai yes yeah, so you know and if you think about it the, the the genotypes are zero one two so you could ask ai to get the, an orthogonal matrix that converts everything to zero one two yeah one thing i can say is like for now i cannot say 100 percent sure uh, but the, to our knowledge is safe and another thing I can show you is this one. So actually, after Richard developing developed this method, we 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 post a HEGP challenge on on, on on the on the website. We are saying, okay, this uh, encrypt data. If you can, I mean, decrypt this one, we are going to give you uh, one thousand dollars. But turns out we they they post this one for a long time online, but nobody uh, is able to do it. Of course, and this indicates it's quite safe. Of course, this may be indicated that 1,000 is not big enough. <laughs> if you get 1 billion, I was not <laughs> the conclusion. No, but, but the idea will be based on our knowledge. Uh, uh, it, 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 it's hard. It's really hard. Because when you talk about decrypt, it's kind of like, think about, let's say you have your password for your iPhone or whatever. It's really not about, I mean, you cannot do it. It's like, if you just try something randomly, it will take, let's say, I mean, one million years. It's like if you just try random numbers. That's the same idea. If you if 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 that's a, just an orthogonal matrix, of course you can try orthogonal matrix a lot. But think about how much effort you need and how much effort we need from uh, computers or AI. It should be very very hard. Mm -hmm. And uh, why do I do that in terms of the benefit? Yeah. Okay. Um... How do we need to go through the, the Jupyter notebook or is that something that each person can do on their own? Um, I was thinking maybe we can, how about we can go to uh, Juan's one at first and if we still have time, we can. Okay, can, yeah, uh, let's do that, let's do that. But that notebook, if we, if, if we have five minutes, I can briefly explain it, uh, whatever. There is, yeah, there yeah. Is one okay. More question. I'm okay with that. There is one more question about using encrypted data for imputation. Just a last minute one. That I think it's worth. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a really good question. It's like a, a short answer is uh, 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 yes, uh, but we, we haven't developed the algorithm. Uh, but but in our group, within our group, Jack, me, and Richard, we have a discussion talking about the potential using encrypted data for imputation. 
So the answer is like for, for, for some imputation method, it, it is possible. Okay, so uh, thanks, Hao. Um, and uh, let's turn it over to Juan. Perfect, thank you. So as, as Jack mentioned, um, this uh, is uh, part of uh, research that we are doing in the context of a coconut grant or the last uh, round of seed grants from AG2PI that we appreciate a lot. So here I, my copy I, are my copy eyes and collaborators. Um, this basically there's two institutions participating in this and then their corresponding collaborating part, uh, industry partners through them. Uh, from Michigan State, we have uh, Rob Templeman, who I think is presenting, uh, presenting the audience, and Mike Van der Haar, and they uh, are working with CDCB, the Council of Dairy Cattle Breeding, on a multi-institution um, uh, uh, feed efficiency and I think soon methane emissions uh, grant. Also, uh, Gustavo de los Campos, with whom we are working on the methodology, and also he's uh, applying this to um, some plant data set. And from ISU, we have um, uh, James Coltis, who's uh, a copy eye, and he also is part of the uh, consortia working on the data feed efficiency. And then um, I am the other copy eye. We have also supporting personnel, um, uh, blessing uh, Ola Bosoye, who's um, a graduate student in my lab, and uh, Julian Hu, who will, um, later in, in this grant will contribute to some uh, computational resources. And one of our collaborators is Jack because at some point we'll apply these methods to the Big Gen um, Canada data if, if uh, they uh, ask, uh, allow us to use it through Jack um, for comparing different ways of uh, joint data analysis with and without data sharing. As it was, uh, mentioned by Jack very well, and it was described very well, genome-wide association and genomic prediction require large data sets to express their full potential. Um, the, that Those large data sets include genotypes, phenotypes, and other metadata, of course. But those are the basic two data types. And uh, especially for difficult to measure traits, there might be several small data sets that are in the hands of uh, a mix of public and private institutions that might be reluctant to share their data because of uh, uh, privacy, but also intellectual property uh, issues. Uh, one alternative, as it was mentioned before, is the meta-analysis, but sometimes that limits the options as I will um, describe later. So uh, federated learning is not, of course, is not our idea. We are uh, we uh, proposed in this grant that started uh, in March um, of this year. We proposed uh, to use some ideas from the machine learning literature, and the idea uh, of this is that there are a, a set of uh, local uh, nodes or devices that would be in, let's say, under the control of each. Uh, individual institution or, or corporation. And then there might or might not be in general, there is a central node uh, that will also participate in the uh, learning, in the computation for the learning. And this, the idea is the data, uh, the data sets are not shared, um, not even encrypted data. So have that in mind and put or put that in, co in the context of the problem that was described by Jack, by Jack before, about um, the mandate to share data. This won't address that necessity, neither the requirements from the federal funding agencies or from the grants. But uh, it can address the concern, let's say, of multi-institutional collaboration um, that might be hampered by uh, not being willing to share even sometimes encrypted data for, some, for one reason or another. Um, the, what might be shared in some cases are estimated model parameters, as I will show uh, today. And that's, uh, it's also called in some way transfer learning. Uh, and uh, it's uh, more similar to uh, meta-analysis. The other possibility is to share some intermediate model fitting quantities, let's call them sufficient statistics, such that iteratively uh, each institution is doing some model fitting, sharing, 
uh, partial results with the rest and then um, uh, receiving those and readjusting the estimates and iterating in that way. And this has been proposed uh, a lot. This has been used a lot in the area of uh, deep learning for image analysis. But uh, in that case, might be to address um, some issues with uh, privacy or data sharing, like some images that cannot be shared. Um, but, but that's not the problem in general for deep learning. The problem is computational resources. So the idea is that there might be a centrally trained model and then with a few extra images and annotations, there is a sharing of some of the model quantities um, by all the participants and there is no need to transmit images or videos which are very heavy. So that, that was the initial um, framework under which the, this methodology or idea, general ideas were shared uh, or generated. And then more recently in the medical field, biomedical field, uh, people started to use this for genome-wide association or for a generalized linear mixed model analysis, especially for inference, not so much for prediction, but more for inference in the case of sharing medical records where privacy are really a concern, uh, privacy issues, and even uh, sometimes sharing anonymized data, which is one way in which this is done, um, uh, might even not, that not be um, acceptable because based, let's say, on a high dimensional phenotypes or based on uh, high throughput genotypes, uh, people or individuals, animals in our case, plants, could be identified uh, by, by working backwards some information that there is. Related to this, as I mentioned before, is the transfer learning that is the one that I will illustrate today because we, we only have so, so many results early in the life of the grant. But um, uh, transfer learning usually is not iterative. And meta-analysis is also not iterative, but in general, in general, although this is not a general rule, meta-analysis assumes some sort of homogeneous effects across populations or data sets. This is particularly true for the meta-analysis that have been used a lot in uh, genome-wide associations in the medical field. If you have a meta-analysis that uh, is non-iterative, combines results, but allows for some heterogeneity between data sets or between uh, institutions, um, subsets, then that probably is similar to transfer learning. And as you know, sometimes in the new literature of machine learning, we are renaming some stuff that already existed. So the, the, the distinction between these two is kind of blurred to me. So, but uh, we, we are doing this uh, in the context of the animal-centric GBLAB model or the individual-centric GBLAB model, for those of you who work with other non uh, animal genetic materials. And, and the idea is that um, in this very simple case, uh, we have the phenotypes modeled as a, the sum of the uh, genetic additive effects of the individuals and then some fixed systematic fixed effects, and then we can contemplate residuals. And although here I have a very simple version of this, this could be uh, through, through modifying incidence matrices and, and covariance matrices, it could be generalized as many as you know to contemplate a large number of cases. But the basic assumption that we have here is that all the animals with phenotypes have been also genotyped and such that we can compute this relationship matrix. If that's not the case and you have a mix of um, animals genotypes and uh, genotyped and not genotyped, probably you have to think of replacing G with um, a single step uh, relationship matrix of some sort or imputing genotypes and so on. And it's been shown um, back in the early days of genomic prediction, uh, genomic prediction research, especially in animal linear genetics, it's, it's been shown that this model, this model is completely equivalent to a SNP lab model where um, we only need to take care of how we parameterize the incidence matrix for the SNP effects and, and, and the model assumptions. And also it's been shown how to go back from one model to another. If you have Z and, and G hat, you can obtain A hat just by multiplying them. If you have uh, G hat, so the estimated SNP effects, you can easily back transform those um, uh, to, uh, actually this is wrong. <laughs> you can back transform those to A. So A and G are, have been switched here. Anyways, um, with, with back uh, many years ago with uh, my former uh, PhD student, uh, Jose Luis Waldron, we also propose how to do GWAS based on this model. And it's basically a way to compute 
a test denominator for the estimated SNP effect and such that under the null hypothesis, it will have an approximate uh, T or, or, or Gaussian distribution, T to the no Gaussian distribution. And, and uh, basically this, this has been applied uh, quite a bit and it's been programmed in, in some of our software, but also in um, commercially uh, and, and uh, academically available software uh, for uh, large data sets. We also show that uh, when we use this type of uh, back transformation of uh, SNP effects and also of their um, uh, variance or to compute a test statistic, we are actually, in fact, uh, conducting an analysis that is equivalent to something called Emacs, where we are testing one uh, SNP at a time. So the results that um, we've been sharing and that uh, some of the results that we we'll share today are for the genomic prediction are considering the animal lab and the SNP lab model, uh, but for testing, we are considering this one at a time uh, meta-analytic uh, GUI that we already published. And, um, and it's been extended and extensively compared a while ago by colleagues in other institutions. So um, in our case for, uh, I will talk today about transfer learning and very briefly we'll refer to uh, um, federated learning. Uh, we, we will assume that we have similar models, similarly elicited models for uh, different uh, institutions or different data sets or different populations that um, uh, cannot be ex uh, exchanged with each other. So the, the, there's no uh, data sharing. And, um, and so there will be sub indexes for those incidence matrices and effects and, and um, response variables and so on. Now, uh, one thing to note is that a big assumption of this is that we are sharing the same um, uh, SNPs, uh, so the same SNPs are analyzed in common between all institutions and that they can be identified. So um, uh, we, we need to have that in mind. If there are partially overlapping sets, there might be other solutions that have been published how to deal with that uh, short of doing imputation, but it's for now we are assuming that that data is available. And, and so we are sharing the SNPs. Also, as it was asked before, uh, there has to be a consensus in, in the way in which the uh, alleles are counted, especially for the homozygotes, of course. And so uh, if someone counts the B allele, everyone has to count the B allele and so on and so forth. However, this is also uh, something that has been uh, used a lot in uh, meta GWAS for, uh, for human data and for model organism data. Uh, in fact, the problem that's been cited in the literature is not the problem of a differential coding between uh, populations. The problem is more of a differential coding between different genotyping platforms. And sometimes what one platform I call A might not be the same that the other platform calls B. And so even within an institution, there may be a mix of, uh, of genotypes. I, I just want to throw that in because it was asked before. And so the transfer learning, again, that uh, um, we are working on right now with Gustavo de los Campos, is a very simple idea. It's an extremely simple idea. And it's almost like a heterogeneous effect meta G1. And, and the idea is that each institution fits their model and obtain the blobs for the, um, their own uh, SNP effects. And again, you don't need to fit the SNP model. You can fit the animal model and back transform. And then those are shared back, are shared with each other. And then let's say the, the SNP effects from one population are multiplied by the uh, SNP genotypes of the current population. And those are added as just as fixed predictor in the analysis. But of course, we need to estimate this um, kind of slope for each of those. And, and then on top of that, we add our own random effect. So if we don't put this part, we are just attempting to do genomic prediction using foreign SNP effects. And we know that that usually doesn't lead very far, um, especially with uh, the amount of LD and the, the amount of discordance of um, agreements of phase between uh, populations and also with the, the SNP chip densities that we are working with, at least in animal brain genetics. But, but when you add your own, your own effect here, there may be some uh, predictive ability recovered by the prediction according to the transfer effects. And then the, the, your own uh, um, 
SNPs will pick up the rest. And again, this can be fit as an animal model or, or as a SNP model, whatever is more convenient uh, for the current data. Federated learning is uh, more complex than that. And in general, uh, it involves using a centralized node and then um, doing the uh, model fitting process iteratively. So in some way, there is a central node that will initialize the parameters and will share those back, let's say, uh, the, the blobs of the SNPs. And uh, in this case, it has to be parameters of blobs of the SNPs, the blobs of the SNPs and, uh, and other effects share back uh, with each uh, institution. Each institution will, do, will use those uh, in updating the likelihood function, and then they will share back some uh, quantities that uh, can be used, like partial likelihoods that can be used to compute a full likelihood, and then readjusted all those effects and share them back. And one uh, ad hoc way that has been used uh, uh, in the in the literature, in the, especially in the human genetic literature, is to um, iterate in the estimation of these effects here. Although there has to be an early stopping rule and it's everything is very ad hoc so far, and I won't show the results, um, in order for this not to converge to just the uh, completely um, transfer learning model that I showed before. So we, uh, so far, we, we are starting to program this and we apply this to a uh, data set that uh, we already use and we published before. It was part of a meta GWAS, uh, two meta GWAS paper published by a former uh, visiting student, uh, uh, Jenny Bernal, um, uh, in my lab when I was at Michigan State. And basically these are data on mid quality from three different uh, populations, two populations that were from um, a uh, public institutions and one that was uh, uh, collected at the commercial institution and a commercial partner. And then they were all, uh, these were all phenotyped for different mid quality traits. And I will be showing one of the color, mid color traits that are commonly analyzed for um, in, in pork uh, uh, quality uh, genomic studies. And uh, in this case, the three populations are very different from each other. Not only, I, I don't have the graphic of the, uh, this, the agreement of phase, but it's really very, very little uh, agreements of phase. So when there is very little agreements of phase, the uh, need, the, um, uh, transfer learning really doesn't bring any um, anything to the table uh, because uh, basically each population um, will get a very uh, very small uh, increased predictive ability from using other SNPs, so everything has to pick up by their own uh, SNP effects. But if we have two more related populations, like in this case, we randomly partition those 1,800 animals from one population into two sets, and this was done many times. I'm showing results of one partition. Um, in one case, for example, we had one population that had um, certain prediction accuracy, still was um, similar to the joint analysis, the whole population analysis. But the other one had very low prediction accuracy, almost it was very, very little prediction accuracy. This was roughly one was 700 and the one was 900 or so. It was uh, assigned at random the labels to partition them. Then when we do the uh, Federated learning and with transfer results, we see a slight increasing in, increase in the uh, prediction accuracy for, for this population, but then we see a very uh, large increase for the other population. And what happens is that, but surprisingly, in this case, the um, estimated heritability is still zero. It means in this case that everything is being transferred. In this case, in this other population on the other side, the estimated heritability is slightly uh, smaller than this estimated heritability without the transfer learning, which means that most of it comes from the from its own SNP effects, but there is a slight increase from the SNP effects of the other population. So one thing that we need now to, to consider is uh, when to do the transfer learning and if it's transfer learning is useful at all or not before embarking on refitting models. And one um, that is possible is to look at first the correlation of the market effects, anyone can do that. However, that might be problematic uh, sometimes, or the correlation may be limited and still share some share some uh, predictive ability with each other. Uh, but the other one that is very interesting is uh, if, if you fit the model, is just to look at the um, 
at the drop in heritability and also to look at the significance of this fixed effect because if it's uh, significant, then um, it, there is a potential for this to uh, contribute. And then after that, there has to be extensive uh, uh, cross-validation, which is uh, might be a computationally more intense. So, um, so far, uh, what we have is that uh, for some of, especially with some big data sets, which, which might be using completely different breed crosses, for instance, the transfer learning might not help. But in other cases, when there are similar genetic materials, trans even very simple transfer learning will help with the predictability. Now, even when the transfer learning does not add much to the overall genomic prediction, if you conduct a meta GWA, like in this same trait, uh, the meta GWA for this trait uh, was published by, uh, by Yeni a while ago. Um, then if you do individual analysis, there was nothing to be found. But if you do uh, meta analysis, then you start to see some significance and there's different ways of doing the meta analysis. That's not the goal of today's presentation. So the take home message here is maybe worth considering also transfer learning for heterogeneous uh, SNP effect for more, for uh, models that allow for more heterogeneity in the SNP effect, so to speak. So that's, that's one area to, to consider. Um, in, uh, that we are looking at with Gustavo and with my collaborators. So what has to be shared to do this analysis? For meta G was, uh, there's uh, more has to be shared than for the transfer learning that I showed. For the transfer learning that I showed, only the estimated SNP effects have to be shared. For meta G was not only the estimated SNP effects, but also the estimated genetic variances from each population and those um, um, test denominators are key. Without sharing those, you cannot perform a meaningful meta GWA from um, from, from uh, GBLAB models. So um, from this point of view, transfer learning or this meta GBLAB is easier than a meta GWA. Um, well, I I think I'm yeah I think I need to wrap up here. But uh, we have more steps, as I said. We we started recently on this, but uh, uh, with collaborating with Jack, we will apply this to. Uh, this is uh, the, the natural disease challenge. Uh, MSU, uh, especially the, led by Prof. Templeman, will apply this to the daily feed efficiency data sets. Those we expect to see more transfer because um, Holstein, these are all different um, institutions that have Holstein uh, animals. So the uh, transfer learning should help and federated learning should help there. And Gustavo, who could not be present today, um, is already working with some crop genomics data sets for this from, from CIMIC. We'll also implement the federated learning and uh, maybe some asyn uh, asynchronous and synchronous federated learning and everything will go into a GitHub and more than just one GitHub will create a GitHub template. So for instance, a, uh, it would be a self-generated GitHub template that can be used by a set of partners to share effects and to share different parameters needed for this analysis without having to share the data. And then everyone can access it and update them, pull and push updates, and that way uh, federate or iterate to uh, transfer. And uh, I think it's not part of our run, but I think it would be worth exploring this. What happens when there's partially overlapping marker sets? We didn't, we don't consider that. Federated principal components, even to see which population should um, care about uh, uh, sharing uh, effects are not a priority. And the other one would be infrastructure for automatic and synchronous federated learning, which uh, would require more computational resources or public, uh, public level of computational resources that um, we are not planning to do in this part of this one year grant. So with that, I think I will finish. And in today's time, I will answer questions. Okay, thanks Juan. Very clear pres presentation. Um, there is a question in the chat from Anya, which is related to um, yeah the point that you made that the SNP chips have to um, uh, yes. be the same. Does that exclude yes. the use of pri pri data from proprietary SNP chips? As we have it now, it has to be the same. However, uh, if there's these proprietary SNP chips uh, share a substantial number of SNPs, and that information is which SNPs they have in common or not. Uh, there's two solutions to circumvent that limitation. One is to get an imputation server going on uh, from a trusted partner, uh, which has data from animal genotypes with both chips or with whole genome sequence. 
and then use that. Everyone uses that. Um, um, B is the imputation of the SNP effects themselves. And there is a paper by the group from Mike, Mike Goddard that shows some ideas for that. So that those could be ways to circumvent. But you have to, sh you have to be aware of some LD information between these uh, sets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you want to stop sharing your yeah. screen? Okay. Other other questions that anybody has, just uh, just speak up or raise your raise your hand. I have a question. Um, so when, when it comes to GWAS, mm -hmm. is transfer learning GBLAP more powerful than meta GWAS? I think um, I think the transfer learning of the GBLAP and then back transforming that won't give good test properties. It's better just to share all the needed quantities to do the meta test. That's how I see it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the transfer learning least, doesn't really at, at, help. At least, yeah, the transfer learning so far is only for, for the prediction because prediction. Uh, yeah, in the other case, uh, with, transfer, with this transfer learning, there wouldn't be a formal uh, test uh, developed, while in the other case, we know the proper, the good and the bad properties of the test. So it would go the other route. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, maybe I, I'll ask a question to the, oh, let's see, to the question from, from Chris. Um, given the previous question about AI concerns with decoding encrypted data, is it true that federated data, the, the, that the federated data approach is inherently safer? Is there more flexibility analyses for one, for one of these approach, approaches? So is it safe? Is federated analysis, is it, is it safe? I guess it's safe. You know exactly what you are sharing and there's not much else to do with that because these are highly aggregated uh, data that cannot be back. Uh, like if I share, for example, uh, X transpose X, uh, you cannot get the X back from there. This we really no. Right. So, uh, but, um, more flexibility that will depend because uh, usually for the federated learning there is a very specific uh, model and result of the model um, uh, thought out so the analysis is done just for that um, like uh, you can train a model for uh, predicting uh, estimating fixed effects and predicting random effects it will do only that but then if you need a pca you need to do more while if you have the data encrypted or not, you can do PCA, you can do other analysis. Yeah, yeah. And um, the second part of that question, so you're, you're, you're using um, you know, mixed model methodology. Can federated learning or transfer learning be applied to other you know, non-linear models, machine learning? It's a, it, actually, it was um, first proposed for neural networks. And so I guess it can be applied. Uh, for other type of models. Okay. Okay. It has yeah. to be worked out on a case by case basis. That's the only. Yeah. Um, I'll skip the question that is a little bit more general. But then uh, Matt Matt's question, Matt Matthew Spangler. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned data and IP. Is the data IP con the, the, the IP concern? Is the, is the data the IP concern, or is it the information that is contained in the data that, that's the IP concern? And if the latter does uh, federated learning solve the problem, um, yeah. Yeah, so I am not sure of the answer to that great question from Matt. Uh, I, I, I think uh, we could ask the industry, but uh, the potential, so what, what Matt is implying there, that what it, they want, some institutions might not want to share the data because in having access to the data, there is a potential to discover things and then patent those or make proprietary. Um, and, uh, but with federated, you share, but you also receive, right? Because the idea of the federated is that everyone can uh, contribute and receive. So everyone has a chance to improve their estimates uh, from that point of view. I would be more concerned about something else, about something contribute, someone contributing data that will affect the results of others. 
and impede uh, progress. Uh, so, but there are there are already some proposed rules to discover that, yeah. like uh, fake data, not mm -hmm. not null data, but fake data that creates artifactual associations, for instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, in both approaches, the encryption and the, the federated transfer learning, you're you're sharing um, SNP effects. Yeah, and you need to share information about the SNPs, right? And that by, that might in itself be confidential. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right? And it goes to Anya's questions about uh, you know the proprietary SNP chips. Well, they all have they may have genotypes for SNPs that are that are proprietary. Yes, right? yes. So they might so, not want to know even what those are. So. Yeah, so we right. work that. Um, so then the uh, the more general question: um, What are the anticipated problems? that could result from this data sharing initiative and maybe phrasing it a little bit now is it is it going to solve the problems of the well is it going to address the confidentiality concerns that limit um, our ability to share data or use industry data mm. uh, it might reassure some folks that uh, they can sh that they know what they are sharing um but i don't know i i don't know if we if will address all the concerns there there are some there might be some concerns that we are not considering from the point of view of the federated and from the encryption i will let our respond but yeah, I, yeah. This well, is it's good to, to test to prove people and say are you willing to do this? I, I don't know. Yeah, I guess for our research, it's also important. Let's say because of the data sharing policy, we will only be able to publish whatever we discovered into a limited number of journals. And especially some high rank journal, they always ask for sharing of data. Like we can at least talking with journals, let's say the genetics one Jack mentioned, we'll be able to say, okay, we're not going to share the raw data, but we'll be able to share the encrypt data. So you can still reproduce. The, the idea in terms of sharing data is because people will be able to reproduce your results. So if by using an encrypted one, they will still be able, able to reproduce my results, it should be fine. So that may be really encourage, I mean, researchers, or let's say future students and say, okay, you can publish your discovery anywhere you want, kind of that idea. Yeah, yeah, and you can, well, not only you not only validate, others can validate the results, but they can also use the data in um, joint analyses with yeah. other data, right? Yes. So, uh, of course, there's limits, and that's one part of the research that is being done. Limits to, uh, there could be limits to, you know, what models uh, or what kinds of analyses can be done on the encrypted data. Mm -hmm. uh, but part of the, you know, part of, you know, what we are doing in these, uh, well, actually this field day is, uh, yeah, explaining the methods, and then we need to ask the question: Well, does it address yeah. the confidentiality concerns that the data providers have? Right, and so that, of course, requires them to have a good understanding of what the what the what the method um, what the methods do and do not protect. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So Christian Tobias asked, how would an independent data order be possible if you're just sharing um, the sampling of the data? No, I think it, it wouldn't be possible in that way. Uh, this wouldn't allow for, for an audit. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't of... this problem. go ahead. No, I, I don't think this is not intended for, for facilitating that. No, and that's, you know, the, like, for example, if you look at the encrypted data, um, it's going to be hard to do any quality mm -hmm. uh, control of that data, right? So you'd have to, yeah, you have to trust that the data that went in is uh, is of good quality. Yeah. You have no... This no and, and with federated learning, there is one extra concern that uh, usually people, I, I've never heard when I talk to people, but uh, I think it is, and, and the, in the medical literature, they mention it. Once you start a iterative federated learning, 
um, let's say server client structure, there is concerns about someone using that and hacking back into the institution, you know, because there's some opening of ports to receive information from the central law. So there's also that concern, um, but again, it's, it's a concern for other information systems. So there is this technology to try to prevent it. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, none of these are gonna address all the issues, but uh, you know, hope, hopefully they will um, enable continued data sharing. So yeah. um, I think what we're going to do is uh, we're um, over the hour already, but I think what we'll do is uh, we'll have how uh, do the, uh, if you're able to, how do the, um, the Jupiter demonstration, but then anybody who has to leave can sign off, but then, you know, we'll keep, we'll keep recording. And, uh, but then, yeah, we'll close the field day and just have uh, uh, how continue with the Jupyter notebook. So I want to thank everybody um, for participating, being here. And um, yeah, of course, Juan and Hao for their presentations and Nicole and Eddie for the logistics and the technical support. Um, and uh, yeah, hope to see you all uh, next month again. And there are also two workshops. Actually, Nicole, can you share your, uh, your uh, slide? It has a couple of workshops that are on, on, call, on uh, uh, upcoming. Yeah, so uh, the two workshops, uh, one is uh, July 12th, with, which will be on the cartogra cartogra plant, uh, integrating genotype phenotype in environment for geo reference plants. And then the second one is for um, moving organisms. Uh, we'll be standardizing data management and terminology for increased uh, increased adoption of virtual fence systems. So both of them um, should be very interesting. So sign up for those uh, early on because they usually tip they usually fill up quickly. So uh, sign up and uh, hope they will be useful. So with that, um, thanks all, and I'm going to turn it over to Hao. Okay, so as like I mentioned, this, this notebook is really kind of like self-explained and uh, it really just re kind of like reproduce what Tara showed in, in my, uh, during my talk. Of course, that one I used a much bigger data set, but this one I simulate a tiny data. That's the only difference. Um, uh, I know for, 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 for AG2PI, we use um, Google Colab a lot. So, Actually, I made, I made two versions. One version is really just a notebook, another one is a Google Colab version. If you want to use Google Colab to run this one, uh, feel free to download that one and upload it. Yeah. And we have four parts. So uh, in this notebook, part one, talking about the basic idea of homework encryption, and part two, just really check the relationship between SNPs and, uh, let's like say, individuals. And part three, we, we, we run a Bayesian variable selection method using the raw data and the encrypt data to show you that we are getting the same, I mean, identical estimated market effects and part four about the joint analysis. Okay, I'll just, I'll just walk you through quickly. So the notebook at first, I'm, and for this one, it's really I'm using the Julia program language to, to code it just because the package I'm going to run is a package we develop in, in Julia, but really, this is really not about any programming language. If you have a look at the code, you can uh, you can have a look at how we do encryption. Then you can throw the encrypt data into a, I don't know, a, a package you are using for analysis, maybe let's say RBLOP, and then you can do the same thing. Okay, this is really not about the programming language. I'm using this one just because it's easy for me to demonstrate it. So we load out the package in cell two, in part one, we talk about, I want to show you how, how homomorphic encryption works by, I mean, showing the code. So in part one, first we simulate, I mean, a, a, a data, genotypes and phenotypes for a sample of 100 individuals, each with 10 SNP. It's, it's, a, it's a naive sample and example, and even I even didn't simulate LD. I just randomly draw a number from zero, one, two to make the genotype and then simulate the phenotype with a certain habitability and some randomness. But, but, but one thing that I'm telling you is like, 
okay, this is a really random data set, but if you go to your real data set, another small data set, it, it works. It's really, because the theory is there, it, it doesn't matter, okay, what, which data I'm, I'm going to be used to, to demonstrate the method. Uh, in, in step two, I just generate a random orthogonal matrix. Instead, there's many different ways to, to generate a random orthogonal matrix, but here we are using a method called stateful manifold. So, so for that one, we are going to generate a random I mean, orthogonal matrix. So for here, I call the P, I just show you the number in P. So by the first five rows and first five columns, those are just some numbers. Okay, but one property like mentioned, P is our orthogonal matrix. Huh? So in that case, you will see if I do P transpose P, I'm getting a, a identity matrix. If you look at this matrix here, we have ones on the diagonal and all zeros on the off diagonal. So it's a identity matrix. And then, Remember, we, we get our raw genotype phenotype, which I call to Y and M. Y for phenotype and big M for, uh, for, for, for genotype. Step three, we encrypt the genotype and phenotype data by transferring the original M and Y using the orthogonal matrix P, resulting in the encrypted M and encrypted Y. So we call, so in a way, Encrypt M is equal to P times M is original M, and encrypt Y is equal to P times original Y. Okay, so basically for the next two cells, I'm just doing this now. So I say M encrypt is equal to P times M. Okay, so the orthogonal matrix times M, and I, I guess my M encrypt. Then I have a look at it. I have a look at the first, I mean, three uh, rows. And for, 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 for SNP1, you see how I get different numbers. But this one is really just a preliminary check. Cannot tell you lots of information. Of, of course, I also encrypt Y. So encrypt Y is equal to P times the original Y. So actually, that's, it is done. If you want to do your own work, uh, let's say in R or whatever, so, so you just need to ask ChatGPT, let's say transfer this kind of, I mean, function to R. Okay, so this one will generate you a random, random generated orthogonal matrix. Then you just load your genotype, phenotype. And for that one, you just do P times your genotype, P times your phenotype. Then you will be able to, you get everything. If you want to validate whether it works or not, you get a package you are familiar with and uh, you just run it. And uh, ideally you will get exact same result. Okay, however, if you have any questions and you find some problems, feel free to shoot me an email. Okay, basically, you just need to know this cell for the function here and uh, basically cell 26 and cell 27 is done. So the encryption is done for, 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 for this simple example. Of course, for this one, we're we are not including, let's say, any other fixed fact, let's say, like gender or less like group, but for that one, it's similar idea. Um, um, yeah. So for part two, I'm, I'm kind of like validate what I told you in my slide. So basically in terms of the relationships between SNPs, they are same, basically the LD matrix, they are same. And the relationship between individuals, basically the genomic relationship matrix, they are, they are different, the correlation is almost equal to zero. But basically for the, for the genomic relationship, of, sorry, for the LD matrix, it's really just M transpose M. Okay, I, so I do M transpose M, I also do M encrypt transpose M encrypt. So these two, I mean, the result from cell 10 and cell 11, they are same, but because this is a big matrix, I just show you the, I mean, the first five rows and first five columns. If you have a look at it, they are, they are exactly the same. Uh, and again, in terms of the GRM, so the, the relationships between individuals, it, it just calculates as M times M transpose. Or let's say I'm encrypted times I'm encrypted transpose. Uh, I'm, I'm showing again showing the first five rows and first five columns, and they're different. If you do the if you calculate the correlation, it's almost equal to zero. Element wise correlation is almost zero. But here, of course, the exact same for, for LD matrix. So if you calculate the correlation, it's equal to one. And then um, this another result I show you in my slide. So basically, 
the correlation, I mean, in terms of estimated mark effects using raw data and encrypt data is, is close to one. It's identical almost. So what I show you is like, I'm, I'm using a package we developed by my group called JWAS. This one allow you to run and different ambition methods. So I just run it. I'm not going to show you this one. So I just run base C basically. So I fit a model genotype of oh, Y phenotype is equal to intercept basically or our mean plus genotypes. Okay. And then you have a look at uh, I, uh, uh, I run it using the raw data. Okay. I also run it again using the encrypt data. Basically I'm using two data sets and run the same method. Okay, once using the raw one, once using the encrypted one. If you have a look at the result, I just got the result for, I mean, my marker, estimated marker effects. If you have a look at the correlation, the correlation is, uh, for this tiny example, it's like 0.99, it's, it's almost equal to one. And I, we are going to get, from the encrypt data, we are going to get encrypted, I mean, uh, genetic value. We need, to, we need, it's kind of the figure I showed you at the beginning. So, so after the data analysis, we are getting for the breeding value, we get encrypted breeding value. So if we know the key, let's say, let's say the data analyst return the encrypted genetic value to us because I have the key as a data owner. So I'm going to use the key uh, to decrypt the, the breeding value. After decryption, if you have a look at it and the correlation between the EBV using raw data and the increase data is again almost equal to one. Uh, heritability, we are get, I mean, heritability using the raw data or let's say heritability using the encrypt data. If you are interested in this kind of I mean, genetic parameter, uh, they are very similar. So 0.65, okay, uh, is the raw one, this is the encrypted one there. They're, similar, they're almost identical. But joint analysis, I guess I'm not going to say too much. The only thing I did is I simulate another data set. Basically, I'm kind of mimic, let's say now you have two data sets. One data set from contributor one, another data set from contributor two. And now I'm going to combine them together. Of course, I'm using different, I mean, key for, for, for contributor one and contributor two. So, so they don't know each other, let's say which key they are using, or let's say which P matrix they are using. But if you if I run this one, I just repeat everything by using the new data set by doing a joint analysis. So basically, I use raw data. I combine the two raw genotype, a uh, two a uh, raw data from two um, contributor together and do a joint analysis. Or uh, let's say I combine the encrypt data from the two uh, contributors uh, together to do a joint analysis. Uh, if you have a look at Again, basically I checked everything again. So you have a look at the mark effect correlation is 0.99. Uh, breeding value is 0.99. And heritability 0.30, they are very close. They're almost identical across, uh, I mean, the, basically mark effect estimation, breeding value estimation, or let's say it's uh, important, let's say genetic parameter you are interested in, we are getting, I mean, identical results. If you're interested, I would encourage you to, let's say, to get a, your own small data. So you can either simulate by yourself or you can use some data you are using. So it might be very useful. So this is pretty much uh, everything about this notebook. Like I mentioned, I do have a collab version. So if you, if you, have, if, if you have been attending this kind of workshop, you have been using Google Collab for your for, for this workshop, you can you can download that one and upload it to your to your Google Colab and, and, and run it. Okay, yeah, that's all. About, uh, okay, th thanks, Hao. Um, any questions from anybody? I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. How uh, how about multi trait analysis with with the unbalanced data? Let's say one institution might have a complete data set or like uh, two traits and the other one has some trait missing in some animals and they yeah, yeah. I, 
That is a good question. I think that really requires some study. One thing I can tell is that for multi trade, if I don't have this kind of unbalanced one, let's say basically all trades are observed for all individuals, it won't be a problem at all. Yeah, yeah. The only, the only thing in terms of that one may become problem is because depends on how I, again, how, how do I, for example, basically, how do I implement multi trade basically? Yeah. When I implement in JWAS, when I implement multi trade basically, but those, I call those missing data. Basically, like I say trade two for individual three is missing, even though it has trade to one preserved. So I'm, I'm sampling that one, okay, in, in, in my multi-trade analysis, but that one may cause a problem because now the one I'm sampling is really not the unobserved real phenotype. In, in encrypt one should be the encrypted phenotype. That one may, may cause a problem. But if, if we just do a mixed model way and assuming what's come most unknown, basically we're just manipulating the matrix. I don't think that will be a problem. It really mm -hmm. depends on, but um, yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of what I'm saying. It's like, we, 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 need, we need further research and further study uh, on the use of this method. Yeah. Thank you. So, so one way I, I think about this encryption is that um, if, if you go to the slide where you have the small example, yeah, or or even it's in it's in your it's in your notebook also, oh. where you had uh, the illustration of the encryption by multiplying by this P, the p matrix. This one, yeah, that that one, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if you look at the the original data, each row is an individual, right? So you have the the genotypes for that individual, and then you have the phenotype. In the encrypted data, each row is a random linear combination of all individuals, right? So the rows are not individuals anymore, but they are random linear combinations of, of all individuals. So, um, so then if, if one individual is missing well, even missing a genotype, that would be a problem, right? Because you'd have to you have to have a complete genotype matrix, and I think you genotype, also have to have yeah. you also have to have a complete phenotype matrix. Genotype definitely is a problem. That's the reason why I think two questions. One question is like, of course, we we can ask a user to to input the data first, and that's why it's kind of re relate to Max Bangler's question in chat. It's like. Whether we have mass, have we considered imputation uh, for uh, encrypted genotype? Mm -hmm. uh, I do think there's some some kind of solution, but it won't work for all imputation methods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good point. Yeah. But but you can only include individuals that have the phenotype. Yeah, it has to be complete. Now I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Right. Which of course, if you do. Um, single trait you know you can do that right without losing information but if you uh, if you have multiple trait yeah you'd have to do something to uh, yeah impute the phenotype for that individual also yeah. good point yeah yeah it's, it's kind of like in your algorithm as long as there's some latent variable involved it may cause a problem it's kind of like the, the categorical trade, internal threshold model, we are kind of like sampling the liability, it's kind of latent variable. Once you have a latent variable, that latent variable really, was the meaning of this kind of latent variable when we when we are using encrypt data becomes quite different, so, so, so. Well, I think it would still be a latent variable for that linear combination of individuals. It, yeah, it should be, right. yeah. 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 All right. Um, well, thank you, Hao, and uh, thanks again, Juan, also. And uh, let's close it off here. And thank you, everyone. Thanks, John. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.